Hello, Room 19. I'm excited to continue Blood on the River, Jamestown 1607. We are now on Chapter 14. The new president committed the managing of all things abroad to Captain Smith, who by his own example, good words and fair promises, set some to mow, others to bind thatch, some to build houses, others to thatch them, himself always bearing the greatest task for his own share. Captain Newport does not return in October with new supplies, but instead of being hungrier, we have finally gotten through the sickness and we are healthy again. The tribes who are friends must have convinced our enemies to stop attacking us, and it is no longer dangerous to leave the fort to hunt or fish. We have a pitiful harvest of wheat and vegetables from our gardens, but the Indians bring us food from their own harvest to trade. The air is filled with birds flying south for the winter. and it is easy to shoot enough for a meal. We have more rain, and the river water is good to drink. Captain Smith has been put in charge of trading with the Indians. If we ever run short of corn or meat, he takes a few men and some beads and copper for trading, and sails off in the shallop for a few days to visit some of the Indian villages. They always come back with the shallop full of supplies. Captain Smith is also in charge of getting houses built for all of us. With the weather turning colder, we can't keep sleeping in our rotten tents. Rotting tents. He sets forth, he sets for us the goal of houses for everyone and cheers us on, exhorting us to push ahead. We work hard together. Captain Smith always working the hardest with some falling trees, some splitting wood for clapboard, some cutting reeds for thatch. We use shaped timber to frame the houses, and the carpenters teach us how to weave sticks together to make a mesh. The, then coat the mesh with a mixture of river clay and straw to make wattle and daub walls. We bundle the reeds to make thatched roofs. It ha I have never helped to build a house before, and it makes me proud to see my work. I see what Captain Smith meant about us needing to stand on many legs to survive. We have to work together. I would never be able to build a house all by myself. Some of the gentlemen work hard with us, too, until their hands are rough as commoners' hands. By the time the weather turns cold, we have put up warm, dry houses for everyone, even the servants. In early December, in early December Captain Smith chooses nine men to sail with him in the shallop up Chickamaunee River. They are hoping to find the passage to the Pacific Ocean and the Orient. They think the Chickamaunee might lead it to it. So they are trying to find a way by river all the way to the Pacific Ocean right here in California. Just so you all know, there is no such river. When I ask Captain Smith why this passage to the Pacific is so important, he explains to me, the nobles in England want spices and silks and ivory. The best place to get them is the Orient, China, and India. Between England and the Orient, good and East over land are the Ottoman Turks. The Turks gladly sell us all the Chinese silks and Indian spices we want. They buy it for two pence and they sell it to England for bags of gold. If we can find a way to the Orient over the ocean going west, we can skip the Turks altogether. And that would make the Virginia Company investors very happy and very rich. Captain Smith and his men leave on a frosty morning, and we all wish them well. Once Captain Smith is gone, through the gentlemen stop working, and even the common men shirk their chores. If it wasn't for us servants, the food wouldn't get cooked, the water wouldn't get toted, and the wood wouldn't get chopped for the fires. One cold morning in mid-December, Richard and I are working with the embers that are all that is left of cabin fires, trying to bring them to flame. Richard, Richard sprinkles dry moss on the embers. On the embers, and I blow on them softly. At the first hint of flame, we add twigs, and it feels good to be cooperating with Richard to be his friend. Come on, fire, Richard coaxes. 
I rubbed my hands together to warm them. It was Abram and Henry's turn to feed the fire during the night, but they, just like everyone else, don't think much of chores these days. The twigs catch, we add some bigger chips of wood. Keep blowing, and soon we have a good fire going. I cough on the smoke. We don't have a proper hearth with a chimney like Mom and I used to have in our cottage. This is just a circle of stones on a dirt floor, and to let the smoke out, there is a hole at the top of the eaves. Our cabin is always smoky. It doesn't even have any windows and has begun to leak in heavy rains, but it is still a lot better than a rotting tent. Within minutes, there's a voice at the door. We need an ember, comes the demand. Richard and I look at each other. Every morning it is the same. As soon as anyone sees smoke coming from our cabin, they come for embers because they all let their fires go completely out during the night. I open the door and find Master Crofts dressed in thick wool cassock, but looking rather blue-lipped from the cold. I take a spoon, fish out an ember from our fire, and send him on his way. He doesn't even thank me. I think they'd freeze if they didn't have us around, I say. And starve, says Richard. Next comes Master Hoolgrave, then Master Frith, then Nathaniel, who has become a soldier asking for an ember for the soldier's cabin. Look how disciplined our soldiers are, Richard says after Nathaniel leaves. Richard puts an ember into a pan to take Reverend Hunt in case his fire, too, has gone out. I go to see if anyone has bothered to start the hominy in the big communal cook pot. I hear one of the guards call out, it's, It is the shallop returned. Hello, explorers. Have you found the passage to India? Captain Smith must be back. I rush to the fort gates. Six men come trailing in. I rush to the fort gates. Six men come trailing in. They are tired, dragging their muskets as they walk. There is not a smile among them, and Captain Smith is not with them. They come on the communal cook fire to warm themselves. There, Abram is stirring the big hominy, big pot of hominy, a porridge we make from coarse ground corn. The rest of us gather round. We listen as they give their report. The river became too narrow to explore with the shallop. Captain Smith went off with two men, Jehu Robinson and Thomas Emery, to find an Indian guide and a canoe. He did not return. Indians captured one of their men, George. Casson. The last they saw of him, he was tied to a stake with a fire being built around him. They were glad to escape with their lives. I listen, my heart sinking lower and lower. Has Captain Smith been captured by the Indians as well? Has he too been killed? Abram scoops the hominy into the mess pot, but I don't want to eat. I leave the fort and go down the river bank. There was our frost last night, and all of the bare branches are coated white and sparkling. I walked along the river a little way, then sat down in a jumble of tree roots and look out across the dark water. What will happen to me now? I have seen how Henry and Abram have been treated since Master Wingfield was put under arrest. It is as if they were suddenly declared every gentleman's servant, always washing this one's stockings, fetching that one's firewood. President Ratcliffe sometimes puts them on double watch shifts, so they get no rest and they go around red-eyed and bad-tempered. But being overworked would not be the worst of it. No, the worst of it would be losing someone I have grown to trust and care about. And I think you all know who that is, John Smith. I pick up small stone and throw it sidearm, making it skip across the water. Five skips. Richard and I should have a contest. I am suddenly very grateful that Richard is now my ally, not my enemy. Reverend Hunt, too. I am thankful that he is still with us. Without the two of them, I would have no one to care whether I live or die. In London, it was easy to survive on my own, rummaging in garbage for my meals. But here it is better to have a few people to stick up for you and make sure you get your food rations. More legs to stand on, Captain Smith would say. I hear crunching, footsteps in the frozen dead leaves covering the ground. It is Richard. He is carrying my bowl and spoon. He hands me the steaming bowl of hominy and sits next to me. Thank you, I say. I'm very hungry now. It would have been miserable to go all day without breakfast. 
He nods, wraps his arms around his knees, and rests his chin on them. Maybe he still will come back, he says. Maybe. When my bowl is empty, I pick up a flat stone. How many skips can you do, I ask? Richard grins. More than you, that's for sure. We gather stones and the contest is on. The letter comes just before Christmas. Three Indian messengers bring it to the forest gate. Fort Gates, and I rejoice to see Captain Smith's handwriting. I am well, the letter says. Fire the cannons and a, fire and a few rounds from your muskets to scare these fellows and give them a handful of beads, a pound of copper, and five hatchets which I have promised to give to the Pumanukis. I run to tell Reverend Hunt and Richard. He is with the Pumanukis, I exclaim. They are one of the friendly tribes. I see he still has his paper and quill with him, says Reverend Hunt. He must still be writing our story. I say beaming. Just after New Year's 1608, Richard goes out before me to start the cook pot of hominy for our communal breakfast. He comes back not five minutes later, his face white as linen. It's gone, he whispers. The corn, all of it. What do you mean it's gone? Yesterday there was plenty, enough for two weeks at least. Richard shakes his head. I looked at the barrel of smoked meat too, at baskets of dried oysters, gone. I feel the blood drain from my face. Are natives now stealing our food instead of bringing it to us? Or have raccoons and foxes got it into our stores? But we had men's on guard all night. I run out of the cabin to see for myself. Richard is right. Our food is gone. Then I notice something else. The fort is eerily quiet. There is hardly anyone around. The only activity is two laborers chopping firewood and a soldier sitting outside his cabin cleaning his musket. The sun is already up, and the gentlemen should have been grumbling for their breakfast. The day is quite cold, with a pale winter sun, and yet not a single gentleman has come to our cabin for an ember. Where are they? I demand, fear growing in the pit of my stomach. Who, Richard asks, the gentleman. What a good end to the chapter. Where do you think the gentleman might be? All right, here's for our language arts lesson for the day. What is a root word? A root word is the base word of a part of a word. For example, it's the phone and telephone. It's the vita and vitamin. Root words sometimes, the roots are real words, like cycle or vent. Sometimes the root words are not real words, like geo or soul. With words in English, they are made up of root words, prefixes, and suffixes. Not all words have a prefix and a suffix. Some words just have a root word. For example, we have bicycle. Bi is a prefix. We have solar, and solar is a suffix, the R-A-R. And then we have regenerate, which has both a prefix and a suffix. Each root word or prefix also and suffix have meanings. For example, bio means life, hydra and water, hydra means water, therm means heat, grav means heavy, etc. Can you guess the meaning of some of these words? Biohazard, hydroplane, geothermal, transatlantic, gravity, microwave, telescope, or technician. We have two discussion questions this chapter. Discuss attributes that make John Smith a good leader. Discuss his negative characters, characteristics as well. Well, I think his good qualities of making a leader is he knows how to divide labor. He had some people building houses, some people cutting wood, some people preparing the thatches. So he broke apart a task into many different stages. And I really think that's part of being a good leader. He also was thinking ahead. He was always goal-oriented. He wanted to find that passage from the Atlantic Ocean 
to the Pacific Ocean. Some of the negative characteristics of John Smith is he left the people. His tribe or his, what he's in charge of is right there at base camp. Probably would have been better to delegate someone else to find the passage to keep camp secure. And I'm thinking that the gentleman might have taken advantage of him being away by potentially leaving. What other leaders do you know? Pick one and analyze good and bad attributes of him or her. So I'd like you to pick any one of your choice and think about the positive attributes and the negative attributes of that person. For our social studies lesson today, I wanted to talk about government. What is government? Government is an organization by which society creates and enforces rules for the good of the people. So in our government, when we talk about when government's being used, when it's being put into action, we call that politics. The purpose of government is this, to unite the peoples of an area into one national identity, provide justice, fair treatment under fair laws, keep the peace at home, defend the country from enemies, and that would be foreign and domestic, meaning enemies that possibly could come from another country and enemies that possibly could be right here at the United States of America. And it's to look out for the well-being of its citizens. We have three different parts of our government. And our government is broken into those three powers, the legislative power, and those are the powers to make laws. And that is our House of Representatives and our Senate. We also have an executive power. That is our president and his cabinet. And the executive power takes the laws that the legislative power brings, and he has the ability to line item veto or censor them. He also is the commander in chief. So right now, for example, Donald Trump is our president. He is the commander in chief of our army, meaning he is number one in charge of the military. He also is kind of the spokesperson for the nation. The third power is judicial power. That's the power to judge laws and what they mean. And the highest judicial law court is the Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court is picked by the executive power, our president. And I just wanna add that all of these powers have checks and balances. They all look in after each other and they kind of make sure that they're all doing what is right for the nation. I hope you enjoyed. That's chapter 14.